I love how it's so simple how God uses us if we'll just listen for him and follow him. It's not complicated, but sometimes when we're talking about spiritual gifts, we make it complicated. We make it weird, but it's not. It's simply our good father who loves us, giving us gifts to use to show his glory, to serve people. Come on, he's so good. I also want to celebrate last week somebody was watching online. I want to say hi to the online crew. Some of you guys watch every single week. We love that. Someone was watching and they asked for a prayer for their back and they said God healed their back. And they went to the doctor. There was no pain. They haven't felt that way in years. So thank you, Jesus. When God does something, we want to give him the credit. And then someone else got healed of tendonitis during the 9 a.m. last week. If you were here at 11, we celebrated it last week. But she was just worshiping, just lifting her hands, and all her pain went away. Someone else had people, come on. Someone else had people pray for them at family night, just about a situation at work where their company is letting a lot of people go because of the recession, and you know they're not allowed to hire anybody, but their department, they needed someone so bad. So they're like, this is impossible, but will you just pray that my company lets me hire this position? And so they prayed, and they got to hire someone. So cool. Thank you, Jesus. We don't want to be shy about the gifts that God gives. These are gifts that we can give to other people to encourage them. We don't want to downplay it as coincidence. And we're not surprised when God shows up. Come on, that's who he is. Jesus said these signs would follow those who believe. These gifts are to show people who he is. I want to welcome you to Crafted Week 4. We've been having a great time in this series. You guys learning a lot, experiencing God? Come on. My name is Ashley, and I'm the senior pastor, if we haven't met you before. But we've been talking about how the gifts of God are like Christmas morning. It's like you trust in Jesus. It's Christmas morning. You go to the tree. You take out a gift bag, and it's like full and you just take the gift on the top and you open it up and you're like, this is amazing. It's salvation. And that means that because of Jesus, I'm saved, I'm set free, I'm made whole, I'm prospered, I'm healed. All the places I fall short, Jesus' blood covers me. All the places that I lack, he gives me his righteousness. I love that, it's such a good gift and we get so excited about it because we should. And when we receive that gift, though, when we trust in Jesus, we're also born again by the Holy Spirit. And that means his Holy Spirit lives in us. And we've been talking this whole series about how the Holy Spirit, he's our comforter. He comforts us when we're hurting. Come on. He's our confirmation. He confirms God's word when it's spoken. You'll feel him sometimes. I felt him this morning on that third song, just confirming and being here with us. He's the convincer who reminds us of our righteousness in Jesus because we're human and we forget who God says we are. So we need the Holy Spirit to remind us of that. He's our guide. He shows us what to do and where to go and how to live and how to live from a place of rest in a relationship with God, and he's the gift. He's also the giver. He's the gift who comes with his arms full of gifts. And the Holy Spirit, he's practical. He wants to help you every day. He wants to be your walk beside, day to day, every moment, comforting, empowering, best friend. And we get so excited that we just, we stop opening up the gifts right there because we're like, well, that's amazing. Thank you. But it's one thing for the Holy Spirit to be in you, And we call that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's another to be baptized in him, to be immersed in him. It's one thing for you to open up that first gift, but God has more for you. And the goal of this series is all about experiencing the gifts the way that God intended for us through the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the difference between drinking a glass of water, you drink some water, it's in you, your thirst is satisfied, and jumping in a swimming pool, completely immersed and surrounded by the water. When you trust in Jesus, his living water is in you, but when you ask God to give you the Holy Spirit, the water overflows all around you. He surrounds you. Like we sang today, we're immersed in him. Jesus said that God, yeah, Jesus said that God is a good father who loves to give good gifts to his children. 
That's who he is. He's so good. I can't stress that enough. He talked about it in Luke 11, 11. He said, some of you are fathers, so ask yourself this. If your son comes up to you and asks for a fish for dinner, will you give him a snake instead? If your boy wants an egg to eat, will you give him a scorpion? Look, all of you are flawed in so many ways, yet in spite of your faults, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to all who ask? You think about getting ready for Christmas, and I think we're all planning to give gifts to other people. If you're a parent, I'm sure you're planning to give good gifts to your children. Maybe you've been shopping ahead of time, looking for the deals, thinking of what they would love. If us people who are imperfect, if we know how to give good gifts, our Heavenly Father who is perfect, He knows how to give so much better than we can. He won't give you a snake. He won't give you a scorpion. He's not going to give you a gag gift or a scary gift. He gives you a part of Himself. That's awesome. All we need to do is ask. My son, Ryder, he is five years old, and he has some gifts that he asked for that he really wanted. One is a spider, it's like remote controlled. That thing freaks him out. So at night before bed, he takes that spider and he puts it in my room under my dresser. <laughs> it's like, you can have the creepy spider. He has all these dinosaurs and we actually have a picture of them for you. He turns them around at night because he's scared of them. So it's just the dino butts. I want you to know that the gifts of God are not like that. You don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have to hide them. They're good. Come on. The other thing is that they're not to keep to ourselves either. In 1998, the Furby hit the market. Do you guys have a Furby? I was 12 at the time, and they were such a cool gift. We have a picture of those if you don't know what I'm talking about. But they're basically an electronic stuffed animal. They could interact with you. You're supposed to teach it English and uh, feed it and take care of it and all those things. They weren't around very long because the NSA got nervous that they could like spy on us, which is really funny because uh, Alexis and Siri, Alexa and Siri and all the things you know that we have these days, uh, I, th I think they could do more than that. But anyway, we had Furbies. And so when I was 12, my sister and I were like, can we please have a Furby for Christmas? And so my mom and dad, they got up early on Black Friday. They went to Walmart to wait in line because you couldn't shop online then. And Christmas morning, we open them up. We got Furbies. We're like, this is amazing. They're so cute. I mean, to a 12-year-old girl, you know, it's like, oh, it's the best gift ever. And my dad was like, they are amazing. You should not open them up. You should not take them out of the box. They're going to be a collector's item one day. You should just take that box and put it on your dresser, and you can look at it. <laughs> my sister and I are like, oh. My mom is like, no, no, no. Carl, calm down. No, they need to take those out of the box and enjoy them. We gave them to them to enjoy, not to just stare at and put on a shelf. They're to be experienced. And it's the same with God's gifts. They're to help us, but also to serve other people, to show the world who he is, to show people how much God loves them. Billy Graham said, it's a waste of time for us to look for power if we don't intend to use it. It's a waste for us to look for might and prayer if we don't pray for people or to ask for strength to serve if we don't serve people. He's saying, take the gifts and do something with them. You won't see them in action unless you take them out of the box. When I was at my Propel Ecclesia mentorship this August, uh, it was led by Christine Kane and Tara Beth Leach, I loved seeing all the women. We were just worshiping Jesus together. But in that moment, some women were also walking around encouraging each other. They were giving each other a word from God. One of the ladies was walked up to this girl next to me and she said, you have been barren for five years. You've been trying to have kids. God just told me he's healing your womb right now. I'm going to pray for you to be healed. And I love that so much because the other lady didn't know her. And she wasn't trying to make anything weird about herself. She was just saying, this is what God told me. And this is what he has for you. And I love that freedom to say, we can use our gifts to serve God. Where God's spirit is, there's freedom from caring about what we look like. Freedom from focusing on self. 
freedom to give away what we receive. I love it because that's exactly what Jesus told his disciples to do. Matthew 10, 7, he said, Go and announce to them the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Give as you've received. Don't keep your gift to yourself. Use your gifts to tell others about the giver. This is normal for those who believe. We're a supernatural people who serve a supernatural God. Jesus was born of a virgin. He died on the cross and he rose again. That's supernatural. He wants us to be empowered. We are people who live by the power of his spirit. We talked last week of, about how we've got the power, remember? I've got the power. You've got the power. He empowers us. Don't settle for what's natural when you have access to the power of God because you have authority in Jesus. Take up your authority, people of hope. Come on. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. God wants us to desire those gifts. He says the most helpful ones, the ones that are available to everyone because of Jesus, everyone who's baptized in the Spirit. We talked about three of them last week. They were faith, healings, and miracles. Next week, we're going to talk about prophecy and tongues and interpretation, and we'll get to the other three in just a minute. He says, with these gifts, we, we, they're available to everyone who believes in Jesus. And our goal with this series is to ignite a fire within each of us, to release and empower us, to open up all the gifts that God has given us. Come on. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, Fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and of self-discipline. Maybe you have a gift right now, and it's just a little ember. It's a spark. We want to be here to help you blow on that gift, to put fuel on that fire until it becomes what God intended for it to be in your life, to show other people who he is. You have the Holy Spirit within you and his power is made perfect in your weakness. You can walk in power. You have a spirit whose perfect love casts out fear so you can love others. You have a spirit who is self-disciplined. So he's your guide, but he empowers you to rest in Jesus, to live a life that pleases God, not out of a place of religion and do and performance, but out of a place of rest. When we use our gift, we use them because they're good gifts from our good Father who loves us. We're not afraid he's going to take our gifts away if we don't use them. I remember growing up as a kid, there were times when I didn't obey my parents. I know, shocking, right? I didn't obey my parents, and they would say, oh, we're taking away a Christmas gift, which now as a parent, I don't think they actually took any away. That would be a lot of work to go back to the store and return them. I just, I don't think they did that. So my parents were always threatening, we're taking your gifts away. It's a scary thought. But the thing with God is he doesn't take back what he's given. He won't retract what Jesus did for you at the cross, and he won't take back his gifts either. Right. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. When you've trusted in Jesus, he doesn't change his mind about you. He loves you. He looks at you and he, he sees his son. He has love for you like he loves Jesus. His gifts are not dependent on you. They're not dependent on me. No matter what we do, he stays the same. He still chooses to give. He doesn't change his mind about people. He doesn't change his mind about his grace. And that's why you'll see sometimes imperfect people operating in a gift. And you'll be like, well, that's not fair. Um, none of this is fair <laughs> because of Jesus. None of us deserve it, but he makes us able to receive it. He gives us the gifts for keeps, and it's up to us to use them. He gives us that free will to say, I will use your gift. Thank you. Today we're talking about the knowing gifts. Tell your neighbor, knowing gifts. Tell the person on the other side, knowing gifts. Tell them, nice to meet you. Sorry I didn't choose you first. You look nice today. <laughs> the knowing gifts, a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits. Now, hang with me. Don't get weird because we said spirits. I promise it's not weird. 
These gifts depend on the Holy Spirit revealing what only God knows to us. That's why they're the knowing gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 8. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another distinguishing between spirits. So we're going to start with word of wisdom. This is just instruction. Instruction. It's not wisdom that's gained through experience or, you know, going to college or anything else. It's a living word of wisdom from God. And the Greek word is the logos word. We'll put it up on the screen for you. Logos equals word from God. So a living word of wisdom from God for your situation, for the moment that you need it in, to make a wise decision, to have the best words to say, to break through a stuck place, or to know what it, to do in a difficult situation. That happens to me sometimes when I'm counseling and I don't really know where to take the person I'm counseling. And I'm like, you know, Holy Spirit, please help me. And I'm like, oh, this isn't the first time you felt this way, is it? And the person's like, no, I felt that way when I was 10, actually. And we're able to root back what they're going through and look at some things that happened in their life. But I don't do that on my own. That's him using me. Maybe for you, that looks like knowing what business move to make. You ask to join a partnership and you look at the books and everything looks good, but then you just have this inkling that maybe you should look at something again and then you find this line item and you realize, oh, this is a, not a good partnership. Thank you, God, for the wisdom to help me in that situation. Or in parenting, what to say to help your child with something you've never dealt with before. I mean, we all need wisdom in parenting, right? You think about King Solomon, he had divine wisdom from God. And one of the examples the Bible talks about, there were these two women who came to him and they're like, hey, we live in the same house. Last night, one of us rolled on, over onto a baby. It died, super sad. But now we're both fighting over this baby. We'll pick it up in verse 23. The king said, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child. Each says that the dead child belongs to the other. All right. Bring me a sword. Uh, the whole crowd's like, what? what? What do you need a sword for? Uh, so a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, divide the living child in two and give half to each of these women. Yikes. Then the woman who really was the mother of the child and who loved him very much cried out, no, sir, give her the child. Don't kill him. But the other woman said, all right, it'll be neither yours nor mine. Divide it between us. The king said, give the baby to the woman who wants him to live, for she is the mother. Verse 28, word of the king's decision spread quickly throughout the entire nation. And all the people were awed as they realized the great wisdom that God had given him. That was wisdom from God for that situation that no one had ever probably heard of before or used after. It was very specific. And I'm sure all the people were like, Solomon, are you crazy? And he was probably thinking, this is going to sound crazy, but here we go. And because he was faithful to just say what God had told him, he was able to return that baby to its mother. I love that. Yes. And the people were awed because they're like, that's wisdom from God. God got the credit for what happened in that situation. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding faults, and it will be given to you. You need wisdom? Just ask him for it. He doesn't find fault with you asking. You, you shouldn't feel like, oh, I should already know. No, no, no. He wants to help you. He's a good father who gives good gifts to all who ask. If you need wisdom, ask. And when he gives it to you, don't downplay it as a coincidence. Thank him for it. Give him credit for it. So that's a word of wisdom. The second one is the word of knowledge. And this is information. This is when the Holy Spirit gives you information about a person to help them. And this is something you don't know from talking to them, and you don't know from talking about them, but it's something that you couldn't possibly know, that only God knows. Yep. And it doesn't come through, you know, research or human means or experience. It comes from God. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 says, To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. 
I love Delina's video because it's an example of a word of knowledge that God had to help her as she taught her kids. And I love that she invited him into that moment. She's like, God, these kids are struggling with stress about this test. And that's not their portion. I don't want them to sit here stressed. Come on. And so he's just like, okay, this is where they feel stress. And as she spoke to them, it's like, God loves you. He sees you. He doesn't want you to feel that way anymore. You're seen and you're heard. I love that the Holy Spirit is not just for Sunday morning. He can give you a word of knowledge for your work or your home or at church. Sometimes when I'm preaching, people will say, how did you know that was exactly what I was going through this week? How did you know that phrase or, you know, that word? That's exactly what I needed to hear. That question I had was exactly what I was asking God about. And I'm like, I didn't know. I'm just the vessel. He's the power within me. I'm the clay pot. He's the brightness. I'm the temple. He's the Holy Spirit. And so are you. The more you use your gift, the more opportunities that you have for God to do the impossible through you. Of course God is going to use me to speak to people. I give him the chance every single week. And I get better at listening. I get better at responding to him every week too. The more we use our gifts, the better we are with them. We want to use our gifts whenever we can. I heard a story once of somebody who called to order a pizza and, you know, as they were talking to the person on the line, they're like, hmm, I just had a picture of this person wearing earrings. Okay, that's kind of weird. Well, I'm going to say it to them. And, you know, they said, this is going to sound crazy, but God loves you and he sees you when you've got those earrings on. And it's like, okay, earrings, God likes earrings. What is that supposed to mean? But to this person, she started crying and she said, I was having such a hard day today and I was really feeling ugly and unloved and I bought myself a new pair of earrings and I put them on and when I looked in the mirror, I felt so confident about myself. And they're like, God sees you right where you're at and he loves you, he cares about you. And then they led that person to Jesus and ordered their pizza after that. <laughs> God gives us words to help people. He might give you a word of knowledge for healing, maybe to reveal something that he wants to heal in someone else. Like I was telling you about that lady who prayed for the woman who couldn't have kids. When you speak that word, faith rises up, and then you can pray for healing. Faith rises up in the heart of the one who receives the word and the one who needs the word. Jesus operated in this gift all the time. When he was talking to the woman at the well, which was scandalous because he was a man, she was a woman, he was a Jew. She was a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews. He told her something about herself that he could not have known. He just met her. John 4, 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty. I mean, it's annoying to keep going to the well. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Now Jesus was not telling her about her five husbands to embarrass her. He wasn't like, oh, I caught you. No, 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 no. We get nervous about words of knowledge because we think, oh, what if all my deep, dark secrets come out? But that's not what Jesus is about. He was telling her that to help her believe. He wanted to open her eyes because he loved her. He wanted her to be free and made whole. He exposed her wound only so he could heal it. Her life was broken relationship after broken relationship after rejection. He had no condemnation for her. He only had love to give her, love for her, and it spread to other people. Let's look at it. Verse 19, so the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. You think? I can see you're a prophet. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. 
I'm not quite everything, but tell her some things. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Because of his words, so many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know this man really is a savior of the world. That word of knowledge that Jesus spoke to her, it caused her to believe, but it also caused her whole village to believe. Come on. These words are to help people. Anything that you think is a word of knowledge that you get from God, it should be shared with great care and respect for the person that you're serving. I love that Jesus didn't talk about her. He didn't talk to other people. He didn't expose her. He used what he knew to help her. Our gifts should build up other people, not make them feel inadequate or afraid. Our gifts say, here, I have this gift. Here's permission for you too. And then allow people to confirm or reject the word that you give them because we're human and we make mistakes and we have different filters. Often the Holy Spirit will give us just a light impression or a prompting that we might be tempted to ignore, honestly, because it doesn't really make sense. But if we want to grow in our gifts, we need to decide to trust that God will use us and he'll use our mistakes too. We need to trust in him and lean not on our own understanding. And as we're growing in our gifts, we want to learn from others. So I started learning about the Holy Spirit uh, like 15 years ago. And I'm so thankful my friend Richie was part of that whole journey. And he's actually going to be with us this Wednesday night at 630 at Family Night. He's on the front row. Come on. He's just going to be using his gifts. And you'll be healed, you'll find freedom, you'll find deliverance, you'll be encouraged. It helps to watch other people use their gifts as we grow in our gifts. So we want to come this Wednesday, 6.30 for family night. We've got stuff for your kids too. It's going to be a good night. Um, So Elizabeth, she was encouraged. She encouraged the Virgin Mary. Uh, She knew the Virgin Mary was pregnant with Jesus because of a word of knowledge that she received from the Holy Spirit. You know, it's Christmas season. We're thinking about the Christmas story. The other day, my seven-year-old Sophie at dinner, she's like, I know what a virgin is. I'm like, oh, what is a virgin? My eyebrows are like, and she's like, well, that's private. I can't really tell you. (laughs) I'm like, you can tell me. I'm your mom. (laughs) What's a virgin? I would love to know. And she's like, well, it's a woman who has a baby before she's married. I'm like, okay, well, that, that is good for now. That, that is the Virgin Mary. So we will talk about the rest of it when you're older. You never know what your kids are going to say. So we got the Virgin Mary, Luke 141. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And I love this because if you think about Mary and how she is a virgin and telling people this baby's the son of God and how other people must have looked at her and judged her and talked about her and how some days it must have been discouraging. I mean, where she was probably thinking, did I really hear from an angel of God? I mean, maybe I got it wrong. And then here comes Elizabeth and she's like, the Holy Spirit just told me. And you are blessed among women. She encouraged her. I love that. That's what the words of knowledge are for, for encouragement. So we talked about words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and now we're talking about discernment of spirits, 1 Corinthians 12, 10, and to another distinguishing between spirits. So I don't believe a demon hides under every rock or that every fight with your spouse is because of the devil. Sorry, a lot of our fights are just because of our humanity. And at the same time, I hope you're not shocked to hear that demonic spirits, they are present in our world today. They influence people from time to time, even people who know Jesus. We're not afraid, though. They have no authority over those who believe in Jesus unless we give it to them. Evil spirits cannot live in you when you have the Holy Spirit in you. There's no room. But they can affect you from the outside. The discernment of spirits is an understanding from the Holy Spirit about the source of a thought, a word, an action, whether it's from the Holy Spirit, whether it's from a demonic spirit, 
or just a human spirit. Sometimes things come from people who are wounded, are needy, and just not whole and healthy. That comes from a human spirit. Some of it comes from a demonic spirit. I love when Jesus said to Peter, Peter's like, Jesus, I don't want you to go to the cross. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. He's speaking to the spirit in him. Part of maturing in Jesus is learning to discern between good and evil and using common sense. And you need to know when it's God speaking to you or something else. There have been times uh, in my journey as a pastor where people have said, you shouldn't be a pastor because you're too this or not enough that or this or that. And I have to know in those moments to say, oh, what you're saying is not from God. I'm called, appointed, and anointed for such a time as this. But the same thing is true for you. Maybe in your career path right now, maybe in your calling to stay at home as a mom or a dad, wherever you're at, people might say well-meaning things or think they know better. They might be like your friend Peter to Jesus. You have to know when to say, no, no, no. I know who God says I am. I had someone come up to me on a Sunday morning a couple years ago and they said, I have a message from God for you. I'm like, Okay, what is it? And they said, we shouldn't worship Jesus. We don't need to trust in him. God told me to tell you that. It does not take a gift of discernment to know that that is not in the Bible. I'm like, oh, we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So you're wrong. And that person was confused and acting strange, and I think they were operating under a different spirit. If someone's gossiping about you or gossiping about other people in order to help you, it doesn't take a discernment gift to know that what they're saying is not from God, but it's probably from a broken human spirit. And when you know that, that helps you to speak into them and say, hey, have you talked to the person that you're talking about? Where you can actually help someone. When Paul was traveling, he was telling people about Jesus. He had an encounter with a girl and she had a demonic spirit. Acts 16, 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. I want you to know that some psychics are real, but you should not mess around with spirits that are not from God. The rest of the verse, she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Verse 17, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. What she was saying, it was true. They're servants of God telling the way to be saved. But she was also distracting from their mission of reaching people. She was scaring people off. They're like, uh, there's a psychic following them. I don't, I don't want to talk to them or really listen to what they have to say. Just because her words were true doesn't mean that the source was godly. You see, evil doesn't have much power except what we give it. So it can distract you. If you let it, it can distract from what God is doing. It can get you so focused on something else that you miss out on what God has for you. It can steal your attention and your peace and your joy. But once you're aware of it, you can take authority over it by the blood of Jesus. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed. I love that he's human. He was so annoyed with her that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now notice he waited a few days. Maybe he was still trying to discern what the spirit was. I don't know, the rest of the passage, passage talks about how people were mad that he cast the demon out because she was making them money. But he said, leave her and she was free. If a demonic spirit comes against your business or your home or your family, the Holy Spirit makes you aware of it through this gift so that you can tell it to leave in the name of Jesus. And when you do that, it has to flee. There's nothing complicated to it, just like this slave girl. So those are the knowing gifts, a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits. And these are gifts that are for us because of Jesus, and he's God's first and best gift. And all the gifts that God gives us after that point back to God, and they help people. The gifts are great, but the giver is greater. My kids have some gifts they love. 
They love to play with them. They love to use them. But when I walk in the room, man, they love me more than the gifts. Man, they want to spend time with me. I love to give them gifts, but I really love being with them. And that's how God is. He loves to give with us. He loves to give to us. But he wants a relationship with us. And that relationship is possible because of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. He took on all the places that we fall short. And we could receive everything that he earned when he rose from the dead. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God loves you so much that he gave Jesus for you. He didn't withhold anything from us. And then besides Jesus, he's like, here's all this other stuff. Here's all my other gifts. Here's the Holy Spirit. Because he loves us, not because we do anything to earn it or deserve it, but because that's who he is. And maybe you have mindsets this morning that make it difficult for you to receive that gift. Maybe your earthly father was not so good. And you don't know what it's like to have a good father. I'm telling you, God is the best, perfect father. He loves you. He created you. He cares for you. He brought you here today. Maybe you didn't know the gifts were available to you. You didn't know God still does give good gifts to his kids. It wasn't just in the Bible, but it's today. Maybe you feel like you're not worthy. But that's the point. None of us are. Jesus made us worthy by shedding his blood on the cross. Our part is simply to believe him, to trust him, to receive. We want to give you an opportunity, like we do every single week, to trust in Jesus, to receive the best gift. So right now I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. We're going to close our eyes. This moment is for you and God. If you want to trust in Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three just as an act of faith. No one else is looking around, just me. I want to know who I'm praying with. We won't do anything to embarrass you. I don't even have to count to three. Thank you, honey. I see you. Thank you, sir. Come on. He loves you so much. Thank you. I see you, sir. He wants to give to you. Thank you. Thank you. He loves you. Come on, can we celebrate these decisions? The Bible says that we believe in our hearts and we confess it with our mouths. And Jesus transforms us from the inside out. He puts his Holy Spirit in us. Come on. And he changes our lives. So we want to pray together. If you're trusting in Jesus, please pray out loud with us. We say, God, I give you my heart. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your freedom. Help me to live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That means let it be so. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. He is so, so good. And this is just the beginning of an amazing relationship with him. If you've trusted in him today, or maybe you trusted in him a long time ago, but this is your first time hearing about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. God has so much for you. And he says, all we have to do is ask. So right now, again, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, if you want to be baptized in him, I'm going to ask you to just raise both your hands up in the air. I'm just going to pray for you. Raise your hands. It's just saying, God, I'm receiving from you. God, thank you that you are filling us right now in this place. We say, we ask for your spirit. We ask for more of you. We ask for your presence. God, we love you. We receive your comfort. We want to overflow with who you are, God. Don't hold anything back from us. We trust you. We want to go into places that we don't understand, but you do. You love us. You guide us. You comfort us, God. Release your spirit in this place over these people. Help us to unwrap your gifts. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on.